This video is sponsored by Scentbird. San Diego Comic-Con came and went. I don't know if you saw, but something crazy happened. Matt, guess what? It's morbid time. <laughs> All right. It's what? What? Oh, besides it's Morbin time, well, a bunch of MCU films and shows were announced, like Wakanda Forever got its trailer, What If's second trailer was shown, Daredevil's coming back and I'm worried, I hope it's good, and ultimately the MCU revealed its saga's new title, the Multiverse Saga. DC also had a good time, The Rock literally appeared in a Black Adam suit, that's dope. Truth be told, there's just, there's so much content. There's a lot, a lot's being produced, especially, you know, for Marvel. So the thing is, if Disney is trying to dominate the entertainment sphere, they obviously want everyone in the world to watch what they make. They want me to interact with it, and that means that uh, I can be as critical as I want to be, because uh, if they're going to take over the world, uh, then I want good stuff to be made. Like I said earlier, the new saga is called the Multiverse Saga. It's right after the Infinity Saga, and that just leads into more fan speculation and expectation. Who's gonna pop up? Is Reed Richards coming back? Are the Inhumans coming back? I want more Inhumans now that Kamala isn't an Inhuman. I want to see Toby again. I want to see Andrew again. I want the X-Men back. I want the Black Suit in Secret Wars. I want a cameo fest in Secret Wars. There's just so much going on, and with just words, Marvel's kind of cornering itself. By being vague, the expectations are now through the roof. People want and don't want certain things. It leads to hype, and Marvel can lean too heavily into wanting to please fans instead of focusing on what's more narratively interesting. Worse, accounts online keep fabricating rumors or just spread rumors that are obviously fake. And it leads to stuff like this. Yeah, it, it's Twitter time again. Imagine if Wanda has amnesia and starts a new life in Latveria. She falls in love with Doctor Doom, and they create Battle World. According to sources, early cuts of Thor Love and Thunder featured a mid-credits gag revealing that Thor's goats Tooth Grinder and Tooth Nasher are evil. Okay? Marvel updates, Luke Cage and Iron Fist will star in a Disney Plus TV series titled Heroes for Hire. Okay. It's directed by Edgar Wright. And it sucks because all these accounts that tweet out rumors and speculation and things that aren't real have just grown in followers because they've been tweeting out real details and real scoops from San Diego Comic Con, and then past that they can write whatever they want and people will be like, oh yeah, I, I follow them, they're reliable, they're a reliable source. And that's how fan expectations grow, that's how hype builds. Hype to such a degree that when some audiences don't get what they want, they'll leave the theater feeling disappointed. And to be honest, I wanted to talk about this with someone who on social media is just loud and passionate about pop culture. Specifically stuff that's superhero related, well, that's soups. LET'S GO! Holy shit, dude. Oh, man. Okay, okay. Before we begin, I just want to ask, have you ever been to a convention? You probably know this, but online, you always see con-goers getting dunked on because they smell like ass. Do you want to smell like ass when going to a con? I don't think so. See, smelling good isn't just to impress people and make them go, wow, that guy smells like fucking fire. Not real fire. That'd be a, that'd be a crazy cologne. It's also about making you feel good about yourself. And this is where Scentbird comes in, today's sponsor. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service with a mission to empower each and every person to express themselves through scent. And let me tell you, these perfumes and colognes smell so great. I was sent three. Parfums de Marly's Pegasus, Confessions of a Rebel Fuck Mondays, and Vince Camuto Om Intenso, or as I would say it, Intenso. My favorite is the Om Intenso cologne, it's really fresh, the ingredients include green mandarins, Sicilian bergamot, cinnamon bark, and more. Scentbird lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every month for just $17. Every month you get to pick what you want to receive, they have perfumes and colognes and a lot of unisex options, they have over 600 fragrances. And with each fragrance, you'll get a 30 day supply so you can try them out before committing to a full-size bottle. You can also take a simple quiz on the site based on it. Scentbird will help you find the fragrance you'll love. So make sure to use my coupon code for 55% off at Scentbird. It's just a little over $7 for your first month. It's available in the USA and Canada. Thanks again, Scentbird, for the sponsorship. Go to the link in the description and use my coupon code to get 55% off. That's like your, your trademark, like, thing you do. I think everybody on Twitter knows you for just yelling, Let's go in like the most intense voice ever. Let's go! 
the the newbie thing, right? I think you were mm -hmm. in the newbie thing. So I remember Twitter when you announced that, which is honestly really cool. But it was very funny because people were like, dude, this is gonna be the loudest movie theater of all time, you know? Twitter definitely went a little little crazy when that newbie thing was announced. My passion and enthusiasm has gotten memed in so many different ways. And I'm here for a lot of it. I find it really funny. When you become somewhat of an uh, influencer, social media influencer in any shape or form, you're always gonna get both the positive and the negative, right? I think that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. You know, how us as influencers, we talk about, you know, certain things like in media, like fandoms and stuff. And what we say can affect how people react to the things they enjoy. Spider-Man, No Way Home, Multiverse of Madness and stuff like that. Do you see how Marvel is starting to lead into more so cameos and a little bit more of nostalgia to hook audiences? So many Avengers are dead already. <laughs> that They kind of have yeah. to just kind of bait you somehow. Oh, you remember this? Just to reel you in. Uh, a little more than they usually used to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something that's like really exciting. You know, uh, coming off of Endgame, which was like the biggest fan movie of all time. And it was right. like Marvel's peak. Like, I think uh, coming off of that, introducing the multiverse and now exploring the multiverse. And with all of this slowly building up to Secret Wars, I think it's really exciting. And it's Marvel's way of kind of just like laying the groundwork for what's to come in the future because whenever Secret Wars does come around, like it's probably gonna be bigger than Endgame, which is crazy to say because, you know, there were so many fans after Endgame that were saying the MCU is done, they can't do anything bigger than that. And, you know, look, we just got Spider-Man No Way Home. That was one of the, like the most hype movies, the, the one of the best experiences. I think this is Marvel's way of saying, hey, you don't have Tony Stark, you don't have Captain America around anymore, and we we know that you guys have grown to love them over the course of a decade, but now we're we're slowly gonna bring bring back, you know, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, even if it's just for a movie, and they're going to service our newer heroes that are going to take center stage within the future of the MCU. I would say there's a part of me that's definitely conflicted because when it comes to like the Disney Plus shows and Marvel movies, I don't want to I don't want to get in this routine of looking forward to every project and thinking okay this character is going to show up and this cameo is going to happen and this and this character is going to interact with this character like right I just I just want to appreciate these projects and I want them to focus on like the lead character and take us on a deep dive of the deep of the main character and take him through a strenuous journey where there's just math, massive character growth and there's there's just massive development for that singular character. I don't want to go into WandaVision thinking, oh, Mephisto's going to show up. Oh, Paul Bettany just talked about a secret cameo in the finale. <laughs> yeah, like I remember in WandaVision when fans were so disappointed that the aerospace engineer wasn't Mr. Fantastic. It feels like with every single Disney Plus show, there's been a certain level of that, like expecting another character that isn't the main character of the series. With right. WandaVision, it was Mephisto. I've spoken to people behind the scenes that worked on WandaVision, and even even they they were very aware of like all of the Mephisto references as the show was going on, and they were looking at all of the theories online, saying like, "Guys, it's not Mephisto. Mephisto's right. not in this one." Then in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, like the entire series was building up to us seeing Captain America. With Loki, it was Kang. With Hawkeye, it was Kingpin. With Moon Knight, it was Jake Lockley. Oh, is Captain Marvel gonna show up? Feige, when he, when he was talking about the She-Hulk series at Disney Invest today, he was talking about like how She-Hulk is a lawyer for superheroes, and you know there's gonna be room for familiar faces in that series. So, yeah, I I I, I am conflicted when it comes to like the way Marvel is using a lot of utilizing cameos and characters from the past. I don't want Marvel projects to outshine the main character of those projects. And I, I want yeah. the conversation to be about the main character of that show. You know, Tom Holland in Spider-Man No Way Home, he was 1000% the main character and they managed all that nostalgia really well because it's these characters who have gone through these movies that we've seen help the main character of this one go through his. And that I think was handled really well. But again, you mentioned, right, WandaVision and how fans expected all these cameos and how Multiverse of Madness, there was also these accounts that were like saying, oh, Superior Iron Man's gonna show up. You have the Multiverse of Madness poster, Deadpool looks like he's there, even though it's just a smudge. So Deadpool is 1000% confirmed for Multiverse of Madness and stuff like that. Sometimes when we talk about these things and we insinuate these things, 
Do you think that fans can sometimes take these observations that we have, which aren't con confirmations, and mm -hmm. run with them to the point where they might expect this to genuinely appear, and then when it doesn't happen, it'll negatively impact the way they watch the movie? I think when it comes to us as creators, like, obviously we're gonna theorize, we're gonna speculate. With a movie like Multiverse of Madness, it's natural to speculate who could potentially show up. There were so many accounts saying, all these characters are going to show up. And yeah. then at the end, only like a few showed up and everybody mm -hmm. was actually angry at the movie for just being its own movie instead yeah. of being like a like a party, like a Marvel party. I mean, the movie's titled Multiverse, yeah, of, Multiverse Madness. of Madness. Us as creators, we can theorize and we can do all of that. We're going to go into judge and review the product that we're given. Whereas like other people, they take our theories and our predictions and what we say in content and they take it as like fact, and they take it as like, okay, this is the plan, this is what we should expect. Right now we're talking about like fan expectations and how fans can propagate these ideas, but yeah. Daredevil is gonna appear in She-Hulk. You said earlier that you kind of want them to focus on their own shows, but what do you think if they fully, solely push nostalgia? Do you think that'll be a good move for Marvel? I don't think the draw should be wanting to see other characters. Right. If yeah. the characters show up, then it's a pleasant surprise and it adds to the experience. But the hype should be generated around, I guess, the journey that the main protagonist is going to go on. No one was going into Age of Ultron saying, oh, we're going to see Rhodey. We're going to see Sam, like right. Falcon yeah. after Winter Soldier. And do no one was going. Been, do you think there's been like a change recently, though? One of the cool things about Age of Ultron is that, you know, we had that party scene around the beginning where yeah. all these characters showed up and it wasn't something we were like, expecting to happen but it happened and it exactly. was really nice but mm -hmm. do you think like now that's like a definite thing that has to happen in every movie for fans to be happy so i still think there has to be that same level of in interconnectivity because the mcu is what it is mm -hmm. but at the same time like it's it's also great to not have the i guess the the pressure of affecting that greater story you know what i'm saying like shang chi yeah. was such a great i thought shang chi was such a great way to do a singular story and and tell a great story and introduce a new character but also tie him into the greater mc with wong with that post credit scene where he, you know we have captain marvel bruce banner i thought that was a great way to to still have a self-contained character introduction but also connected to the larger mcu and i feel like every mcu project has to have both of those elements so let's talk about you know how dc has completely fumbled the bag of like multiple times dude you're literally called soups uh i can assume you're a superman fan not just by the shirt but by oh, the, yeah. the two statues in the back oh, right yeah. there of superman there's been so many interpretations of a superman like character in other media like the boys having homelander and those shows and movies have fans and that is kind of, I feel, skewed the perception of Superman in media. I think people now see Superman as kind of like a boring character. Unless, you know, he's like killing people. How do you think Superman has been treated and what people now expect from the character based on what WB gave, what Snyder gave, etc.? It's very frustrating to be a Superman fan because to me, this is the greatest character of all time this is the like this is the character that gave me strength when i needed it when i was a kid this is the character that i've related to my entire life the last time we really saw superman in theaters was 2017 now five years later we still don't know when we're gonna see superman on the big screen again i'm looking at the world celebrate batman but at the same time there's a part of me that's like damn i want the world to celebrate superman this same right, way right. because superman is he's the hero amongst heroes he's the the hero that He's a hero's hero. So mm. I love Superman so much. And it's just, it's been very frustrating. Uh, I guess knowing that DC hasn't really handled the character well whatsoever. I love Man of Steel, literally have a Man of Steel poster right above this camera. Love Henry Cavill as Superman. And I thought his, Henry Cavill's Superman was left off in such a great space after the Snyder Cut or after Justice League. You know, now after that, three movie arc he is like the superman we know and love he's the superman that the world can appreciate he right. is that symbol of hope for people and then like but right at that second it's like they stopped it it's what? like now he's superman and now we're not gonna see it yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's frustrating to be a superman fan but i swear i swear to you mauricio 
the sun will shine on us again one day. <laughs> nice, dude. Nice, and when dude. it does, yeah. it'll be the brightest day ever. Yeah, because, okay, we have Superman gone, and supposedly Supergirl is now going to take his place. And, like, mm -hmm. that's that's what the Flash movie is going to be. And everyone has all these expectations of what the Flash yeah. movie is going to do. I personally think that the Flash just can't win. Because there's so many issues going on with the movie, obviously. Yeah. And yeah. it has to pull off so much that I think there's just going to be someone that will be disappointed. I think many people already are disappointed by the state of the DCEU. Right now, the Flash movie is a complete disaster. Not because of the actual film itself, because of those, I guess, outside elements that are affecting the movie. I just feel so bad for everyone involved. I feel so bad for Sasha Kyle, who's gonna be one of the like first major Hispanic actresses to play like a character of that yeah. like uh, on scale. that scale. Andy Muschietti has been putting in his blood, sweat and tears, heart, soul, all of it, all of it into this film. And the fact that now the Flash movie is kind of just a lose-lose situation for Warner Brothers in general is so sad because man, the Flash is so, such a great character. Yeah. He, like he's one of my favorite superheroes of all time and mine too man. and the dude, show yes. when i was little yes. i was like dude this is the sickest thing ever it's amazing and i'm like i want to see this on mm -hmm. the big screen ezra miller was cast as the flash and like maybe a flash movie was announced around the time that the flash season the first few seasons of the flash were coming out yes. and there's still no flash movie like yes bro. this has been such a disaster of like epic proportions to me it comes down to a lack of leadership um at, at warner brothers and a lack of vision Man, like these are the greatest superheroes of all time. In my opinion, when DC does those characters justice, there's no comparison between DC and Marvel because yeah. in my opinion, DC has the better characters. Marvel's got Kevin Feige, they have leadership, they have yeah. vision, they have all of the right pieces in order to make that universe work. When you put power in the hands of someone or a company that doesn't know how to wield it, then it's it's gonna be it's gonna be disappointing. I still think DC has a bright future, and again, they they they've struck gold on many different projects. The Batman allowing Matt Reeves to do to and to do what he's done and to work his magic on that Batman character in his own standalone franchise. So excited for the future of that. So excited for Joker too. What the hell, musical? Okay, they're doing everything great on the things that aren't connected to I guess the DCEU and aren't connected to that larger story. Right, Marvel had this universe being created. Fans expected DC to do the same, but ultimately that yeah. hurt them because DC was just listening to what was popular and what was popping and they didn't really plan out what Marvel was doing. Playing into what is popular and what people expect to see, do you think that can ultimately like hurt these companies in the long run if they only rely on what people want to see and what people are seeing rather than creating something that is genuinely good. I think it's a balance of giving the fans what they want to see, but also giving the fans something that they didn't know they actually wanted to see. Nobody mm -hmm. was expecting an animated movie with Miles Morales in it, but at the mm -hmm. end, it was something that the audience loved, but they never expected. There has to be a healthy balance between giving audiences and fans something new well, at mm -hmm. the same time, understanding that when fans and audiences go to see an IP, go to see like a, a, a movie that's like a sequel from like this other movie that they loved, they're going to have expectations towards uh, the movie in some certain way, or even shows too. But at the same time, mm -hmm. companies can't just fall onto that. They also have to give something new, like Top Gun. Have you seen Top Gun? Yes. Love Dude, Top Gun. Top so Gun is good. so good. If they're going to do something that's like a sequel or something that could hit hard with nostalgia, just don't entirely focus on what people want to see. No, don't entirely focus on nostalgia, but also focus on crafting a new story that takes the characters we love somewhere new and exciting. There always has to be that level of balance between expectation and what we want to see um, and giving us, uh, I guess, a piece of that, but also giving us those surprises and giving us things that we didn't know we wanted to see because that just makes for the best experience. All right, so I guess let's let's shift on on to Star Wars if if you want to. So Star let's Wars go! recently, you know, <laughs> The Mandalorian, it was completely self-contained and then they started sprinkling in like bits and pieces of Star Wars lore. In the end of season 2, we straight up see Luke Skywalker appear in his bundled CG mess. You know, it was it was definitely a take. It was definitely interesting to see that kind of 
mentality of the nostalgia, how that's also seeping into Star Wars, and I haven't really seen that from Star Wars until very recently. I feel like there's, again, all these expectations now for these characters to pop up, when at the beginning, it was just, you know, The Mandalorian, you know, Boba Fett now. Two of those episodes were just on The Mandalorian, which is The Mandalorian Season 2.5. Not everything is just nostalgia-driven, but, yeah. you know, at the same time, lots of fans just want to see everything we've seen already just again, you know? And so yeah. what, do you, what do you think of, like, what you're seeing with Kenobi going around? The hype and the expectations that we're, we're getting in the Marvel Universe, with, like, all of the cameos and... Uh, all of these like returning characters that's kind of seeping over into Star Wars and I think it's it's really become so apparent with the Kenobi series if you don't do those characters justice and you do the story dirty and it's just like I guess it it's underwhelming then it's um it's gonna be a massive thing and it's gonna be a massive loss a massive hit the rise of Skywalker just the fact that they got Palpatine from where he ended and then just bringing that back and how they utilized yeah. nostalgia and how they used all these things from the past to hype up this latest film i felt was almost like a an unearned end game and like see that's the that's the tricky thing that's that that's why i think the sequel trilogy got so got so much criticism and and backlash and it didn't that story didn't resonate with a lot of different people because you're bringing back characters that literally like in, like it just impacted so many people's lives and so many people like shaped themselves to be like these characters so many people shaped themselves to be luke skywalker and when you bring back luke skywalker and he's just like a loser on a planet like just like com that, that has completely lost hope and is very different from the luke skywalker that we remember that's certainly not gonna like sit right with a lot of people yeah, same thing with sure. pa palpatine you know the mm -hmm. the the main villain of star wars really um, to just bring him back out of nowhere and I guess announce that he's just back in the opening crawl. Like yeah, they actually announced his reveal message on Fortnite, which is pretty crazy. The great error is corrected. The day of victory is at hand. So I think that's why the sequels got so much backlash. I mean, if if you if you love the sequels, like all the power to you, but um for for me, it it wasn't it wasn't my cup of tea and I, like a lot of people share that same sentiment because because of the way they just like treated a lot of those uh, heroes and villains that that we love so much. I personally really love The Last Jedi. I think The Force Awakens is fine and I really dislike very much The Rise of Skywalker. But I can understand like where people are seeing Luke Skywalker now. And again, it goes into those expectations of this is what I wanted then this is what I got. That's not the story they wanted yeah. to tell, and so it also hurt the movie in that way. There's always like a disconnect between what the company's gonna give and what fans expect, and usually if it differs too much, then it'll eventually just hurt the company because fans will feel like they aren't being heard. Like there's been so many creators that have just stopped completely creating Star Wars content. They've stopped giving their thoughts about Star Wars on the internet because there's always gonna be like a mob of people that disagree with them and and try to like tear them down for their opinion. But us as creators, I think we have to stand firm and we have to, I guess, remember that, you know, we gotta stand by our beliefs and like what we love and right. not let the the outside world or all because of those negative I, people. I remember your your tweet on Star Wars that was like, oh, you know, I, I, I think when people say like the Star Wars community is very toxic, you're like, oh, but you know, I. I know that this community has a lot of love in it. I had deleted that tweet because it was just like, it was just worded in a way where it could be taken so out of context. I never wanted to ignore like the things that other actors and creators that have experienced from the Star, from certain Star Wars fans. You don't consider that toxic part of the community to be part of the community. The majority of people can agree with that. All of that toxic shit that goes towards actors and creators that stuff is bad. The majority, I think, the majority of the people that love Star Wars can agree with that statement, and the hopefully. majority of us, <laughs> hopefully, like, not. Hope, oh my God, where are we, <laughs> yeah. bro? If not, we're, we gotta have a different conversation. <laughs> you know, I think the the moment we label something uh, in its entirety as toxic, that's what it becomes. Not to sound egotistical, us and people like us, creators like us, are very important in preserving kind of the popularity of not only things that are coming out. But things that have come down came out come down in a way we should 
understand like our position, but also in a way kind of be proud that we have this influence on pop culture in a way. I started creating content to just like, literally, I guess, be the person I wish I had in school. Mm -hmm. I was always just the crazy, passionate, superhero nerd that the internet knows me to be. I had other friends that were fans and we would, you know, theorize and we would speculate, but I never never had people that matched my energy. So now being able to like, I guess, express my my passion and, and share my thoughts on the internet, it's allowed me to connect with some really amazing bands. And you you can speak on this as well, but like, it feels like this community is like, it's like almost like a, a boat and we're all just like sailing through all of the projects that come and we're doing it together. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's always gonna be like, whenever, every single time we watch a movie or a show, um, we're always gonna be coming back to the social media platforms to share our thoughts, to engage. And man, I'm really grateful for it. There's obviously like the, the uh, very bad and like negative side of things with just other people that, you know, are wanted like tear down other creators. But for the most part, man, it's it's honestly something I'm so grateful for. I mean, I don't think you ever expected like to have an audience and to have people go like, oh, I know that guy that soups, you know, it's it's a very humbling thing, especially when people say like, oh, your content has affected me in such a way you, you make me excited for things and stuff like that. And I think that's one of the best parts about being a creator. And and also like the different viewpoints, like, dude, I've I've watched so many of your videos and there's been times where like, I, I will watch a movie and or a show and I'll love it. And then I'll go back to your videos and like you had your criticisms. It doesn't impact my love for what I just watched, but it also offers me a new perspective that I can respect and that I can right. understand. And it's wild because like some people take, you know, opinions and they think, oh, because you think that way, you're attacking what I think. If and I could say one thing to the internet, it would be, I swear my opinions are not an insult to your character. Right. I feel like every creator same. would usher that same statement because like we all have different opinions. And yeah. when you're a creator, you're gonna have people that follow you that either agree with you or don't agree with you. But guess what? They're just opinions. Yeah. That's it. Thanks so much, Matt, for, you know, coming over here and talking to me about this and sharing your opinion on fan expectations. Um, Thank you, man. I appreciate yeah. you so much. Yeah. I want to ask uh, if we could do yeah. together one let's go. Oh, we got to do it. All right. All right. Here we go. I don't know how you prepare for that. Your lungs are crazy, dude. All right. All right, ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. Let's go! go! Oh! All right, man. Thanks so much for uh, for joining me, dude. As I said goodbye to Matt, I recognize that while some people are way more excited and way more thrilled to see these upcoming entertainment releases compared to other people, ultimately, a lot of us are worried about the same thing. That's the distinction between a product and a work of art, no matter how bad the work of art may be. We don't want the characters, films, and shows we love to be treated like products meant to generate money even though, you know, they are supposed to generate money. Most of us want a good story, a good message, a good journey for the characters we love. And look, fluff thrown in for the fans, that's always fun. Some nice fan service, that's cool. But at the end of the day, what we want is an enjoyable experience that whisks us away from the monotony of everyday life and takes us into the world where the impossible is possible. Thanks so much everyone for watching the video. Thank you Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Remember use code BROWNTABLE at Scentbird.com for 55% off. Thank you so much to Matt for hopping on this topic with me. Check him out on TikTok as Soups, on YouTube as Soups, and on Twitter as at the Real Soups. Thanks so much again, King. Make sure to check out Interstellar Ranger Commence, the animated series I'm creating. Episode 2 is coming out soon. Speaking of IRC, thank you so much, Schmert, for this awesome Hope Griffin drawing. She looks adorable and in deep, intense thought like she usually is. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you so much, patrons, for supporting the channel. Y'all help me stay afloat, so I appreciate y'all. If you want to help out the channel, consider joining the Patreon. And remember, just subscribe and turn on notifications to get a chair at the Brown Table. You will be a part of the Brown Table. Remember, everyone, we meet every Sunday at 7 to shit on Thor Love and Thunder. Attendance is mandatory. Thanks again so much for coming to the table, and I hope to see you all next time.
Don't save me for a pass up until the 